Ghost. <laughs> but again, Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 16. When you have it, just say amen so I know we're all together. <clears throat> so see, here's some pages turning, so here's time. Again, Romans 1, 16, and it reads, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'm going to read that one more time. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, we thank you and be honor you for this moment and this time that you have ordained and appointed for us to stand before your people. We're asking, Lord, that your anointing would come, that anointing that breaks every yoke. In the name of Jesus, we bind every spirit in the name of Jesus that would try to stand up against your word, God. We plead the blood in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, God, you already spoke a word of victory in this place, oh, God. So we stand firm on that, Lord. Believing today we will see a victory. Believing today, oh, God, that we will have victory over the enemy, oh, God, over every situation that is not like you. God, preach me even now, oh, God. Help me to decrease, Lord, that you could increase in me, oh, God. Help me not to use my own mind, my own will, my own intellect to deliver this word, oh, God. But I'm asking that your spirit, oh, God, would come and move in a mighty way, oh, God. Save, heal, and deliver in the name of Jesus. Now, somebody give him a praise. If you believe that God wants to do something here today, give him a praise. Hallelujah. Itashata in the name of Jesus. You may be seated at this time. Our thought on this morning would be the power of the, the gospel. What are you ashamed of? The power of the gospel. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Shame could be defined as a painful feeling of humiliation or distress. <clears throat> by, caused by conscious or wrong or foolish behavior. It could be also qualified as a loss of respect or esteem of someone that's dishonored. I could think of my own uh, childhood, and uh, sometimes your parents tell you not to do certain things, and you do it anyway. And in the moment, you feel bad. You feel uh, ashamed because you know you really shouldn't have did that. You really shouldn't have broke something and not said anything. I can only talk about myself, right? You break something and try to pretend like it didn't happen. You try to hide it away. And then your parents find it and say, what happened? I don't know. You know what happened, right? But it's that, that feeling that comes over us when we know we have done something wrong. Many times when uh, we feel ashamed, we have a sense of inferiority. We have a sense of being less than. Uh, we have a sense of being rejected. And many times that can be an internal feeling, but a lot of times it's really due to uh, the social or uh, the context that we're in, right? Um, whether that be sometimes we uh, are in school, we might not have done as well on a test, and everybody else is good getting good grades and bragging about it, and you feel kind of ashamed because you know you didn't really study the way you should have. You were, uh, like me, I love video games growing up and push, push studying off till the last minute. Uh, and so when test time came and you saw that, that number, you kind of kind of folded your paper over it because you didn't want anybody to see how bad you did. So we understand that that feeling of shame really uh, in the context of this scripture, what Paul is talking about is from the outside. It's from uh, the perceived perspective people might have of us. In the scripture, Paul tells us that, that we should not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Was Paul saying that? Well, you have to remember in the day and time that Paul lived in, uh, Christianity was a new thing. That he had come out of the Jewish uh, religion. And so his people looked at him kind of strange. He uh, had to deal with peer pressure from the outside because they said, you should know better. Uh, you grew up, and if you know anything about Paul's history, he was well-versed in the scripture. He was well-respected. He was a teacher of the law of God. So they looked at him as someone to be highly esteemed. But uh, as he began to preach this gospel of Jesus Christ, people looked at him and said, what are you doing? This is not the way you were raised. 
Or not only did Paul have to deal with the external pressure from his own culture, but the environment that he lived in uh, with the Roman uh, rulers at the time and the people uh, that we would call maybe pagan or uh, Gentiles or non-Jewish people, they looked at him as if he was crazy as well. What are you talking about this resurrection of a man that died? Uh, the scripture in Acts let us know the people called him a babbler. They, they called him a person that just said things that just didn't make sense. Uh, but in the scripture, Paul wanted to, uh, wanted to let us know that we should not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and as I begin to think about it, this is the exact type of environment that we live in today. Uh, that people, uh, the devil really has crafted uh, in our society, in our schools, uh, even sometimes in our homes, an environment where we feel intimidated, where we feel that if we believe in the gospel, if we believe in the word of God, we, we kind of look and sound foolish. We kind of look stupid. Uh, and so we kind of we shrink back from really proclaiming the gospel the way that we should. Many times the devil would try to use science, uh, the scripture would say so-called, uh, to make us think that what we read in the Bible can't be real. He, he tries to use you know, things like evolution and uh, even just our own intellect to uh, defy what we read in the scripture. Uh, but the scripture lets us know that God is not a man that he should lie, uh, nor the son of man that he should repent. If, if one jot or one tittle failed, uh, then heaven and earth would pass away. So it is not us that should feel ashamed. It is not us uh, that should feel uh, like we are less than the world uh, just because we do not go, as the scriptures would say, to the same excess of riot. Uh, but they should be the ones that are ashamed. You know, this, this world is crazy. The scripture let us know there would be a time where people called the good evil and evil good. And that is the day that we live in where people will look and see and do certain things. And you're wondering in your mind, how, how do you not have no shame? How can you walk out of your house and, and dress the way that you do? How can you speak the way? that you do how can you treat people the way that you do it is shameful there was a time where uh people just had some certain level of respect and self-respect uh, but now that is not the time you know the world should be ashamed when you get so drunk that you forget what you did the night before you should be ashamed when you have to smoke every single day uh just to be able to live just be able to move uh just be able to function with the problems of life you should be ashamed uh when you abuse others and abuse yourself when you don't have any self respect where you think about harming someone else you're so angry you're so frustrated that you want to take it out on somebody else you uh you're so depressed and you're so down that you want to even harm yourself these are things that we should be ashamed of People today, they just gamble all their money away regardless of what their responsibilities are. Parents uh, abuse their kids. You would think in their mind, these, these kids came from your body. Why wouldn't you treat them a certain way? But we see these things going on in the world and nobody has a problem with it. Nobody's mad or upset. Nobody's picketing and saying this is an issue. They're just living life doing what they want. Uh, but Paul wanted to let us know we can't be uh, ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What is that gospel? What is the gospel? Somebody said it is the good news. Uh, simply it's the good news that uh, our loving God came into the world and he wanted to know what it was like for us uh, who were sinful he wanted to understand where we were coming from if you look at any other religion uh, you don't see a God that would come to experience what humanity would experience you don't see a God that is so conscious and so in touch and so in love with his creation that he said you know what I am giving you commandments to do but I want to see if I can actually do what I'm telling you to do myself and so the scriptures let, lets us know that Jesus came in the form of a man he came just like us and, and what's beautiful about the scripture he said he was tempted in every aspect but he did not sin that means every temptation that we deal with every situation that we deal with that we have frustrations about Jesus already experienced he said I understand where you're coming from and that's a beautiful thing that our God understands. But uh, not only did he come to understand, he came to be a sacrifice. He came to lay down his own life. Uh, the Bible says no greater love has a man than this, that he would lay down his life for his own friend. How many people uh, who know that they might have somebody or might know someone in prison and they, they might have got that death penalty. How many people would stand up and say, no, 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 don't take their life. I'll, I'll take their place instead. I'll be the one to take the punishment 
that they deserve. But Jesus, he came into the world uh, to do exactly that for us uh, because we had sinned. We had disobeyed God. Everybody knows uh, the scripture says to him that knoweth to do right and doesn't do it. It's sin. You don't have to know every single scripture in the Bible to be in sin. Just the fact that your parents might have told you don't do that and you did it, that's sin. Just the fact uh, that you might be going uh, 75 in a 60, technically that's sin. But we don't think about it that time because we're disobeying what we know is right. But God said, I come to take that punishment. I come to take that shame away from you. And, and it wasn't just a regular death. It wasn't just uh, they stuck him with a needle and he died. No, he died a bloody death. He, he hung on a tree. They beat him all night long. How many times do we think about the sacrifice that Jesus paid for us? How many times do we contemplate what he actually had to go through? Before he even could get to the cross, he had to pray three times. God, if it's possible, let this cup, let this punishment pass from me. It's crazy to think that Jesus came with a purpose and even he didn't want to go through it. Uh, why did he not want to go through it? Because he knew uh, the pain that he actually had to go through, the suffering he had to go through. They whipped him. Uh, they beat him. He be the scripture says that uh, he was beat so much that nobody could even recognize him. We're in this time of of uh, uh, Black History Month, and, and I don't know how many are familiar with Emmett Till, that young man uh, that got in trouble back in his time. And, and what was so uh, jarring about that case is because when he uh, was beaten, when he was uh, jumped by these men, uh, they disfigured him so bad. Uh, and his mother said, no, I want people to see exactly what this young man had to go through. And there was no difference with Jesus. That he wanted everybody to see, this is what I'm doing for you because I love you. I'm taking what you deserve. I'm taking that beating. I'm taking that scourge. I'm taking nails so large that go through my hands. I'm taking that plunging in my side by a spear because I love you. That is the power of the gospel. That is what the gospel is. Uh, but I, I'm so thankful that not only did he die, but he rose again. My God, nobody else can claim that they died and they came back again. And, and the scripture is so powerful. And this is why people look at us and say, that's foolish. How can you believe a man uh, that existed? First of all, they, some people don't even believe he existed. But you believe this man existed and that he died and he got up from the dead? Who has done that? Nobody has experienced that, and that seems foolish. That seems ridiculous to our natural minds. But when you believe, oh, on the death, on the burial, on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is power uh, that becomes on your life. And the Lord wants to let us know we should not be ashamed. Uh, I thank God for that power because uh, the this, this scripture lets us know the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is going to quicken, is going to make alive our mortal bodies. That we also would not have to taste that, that we also can have eternal life when we should have had eternal death. What is eternal death? Eternal death is separation from God forever. Have we considered eternity? When's the last time we thought about where are we going to go when we die? Where, when is the last time we thought about where are we going to go when we breathe our last breath? Will we eternally be with God or we will be eternally in not only separation from God but continuous death? And that's all hell is. It's continuous death. The scripture says the worm doesn't die. You don't have the same body where you might burn up and it'd be over. You don't have the same body where you might get bitten and you can heal back again. No, this thing just keeps on going and keeps on going and keeps on going. I, I could barely imagine 50 years from now. How about 500,000, 500 million years in the same place over and over burning alive and keep and you're still alive but you're still dying. That's what we deserve. But I'm so thankful for the grace of God. I'm so thankful for the mercy of God. Because he said, I want to make a way so you don't have to endure that. I want to make a way that we can have relationship forever. 
You uh, sometimes there's, there's, I think about the Bible how the, the scripture says that God spoke the world into existence, but uh, He did that in seven days. But uh, God, Jesus said, "I'm going to prepare a place for you," and, and it's been two thousand years. So if we think this world is beautiful, we think this world has wonders and majesties that we can't even fully comprehend. How can you imagine heaven to be? Uh, the scripture said the streets are paved with gold. The thing you use to pave is not something costly. The thing you use to play is something that's useless, but the very streets you walk on are paved with gold. And not only that, but you're in the presence of an almighty God. You're there to just worship. How many people just love to worship God? How many people just love to be in the presence of God? I don't know, there's nothing like it, whether it's in the church house or in your own home. There's something that happens. You you might not be able to explain it, but you just have this feeling. You just have this joy. You have this peace. You have this contentment, and everything might not be perfect. Everything might not be right, but you're just thankful. God, that I have your presence. God, that I can feel your anointing, that I can feel your power. I don't want to take that for granted. I don't want to think that that's a, just a casual thing. But God said, can you imagine being in my presence forever? He said, in my presence, there is fullness of joy. At my right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. That's what God is offering for us. But it simply takes belief. It simply takes belief. And so Jesus wanted to let us know that same power that he had when he he came from the dead. He rose and he said, all power in heaven and in earth is given in my hand. Uh, And we think about power in this day and time. We think uh, about firearms. We think about maybe bows and arrows. If you're old school like me, I like that kind of stuff. You think about uh, swords. We have nuclear power. We have power that, that can extinguish this whole world at one time. But God said, I have a power that's even greater than that. I have a power uh, that I want to give to you that's more powerful than any weapon man can conceive in their own mind. And, and this power is not just going to be used for you to do harm from others, uh, but this power is going to be in your life. So the things that you're battling with, the things that you're struggling with, uh, the things you can't help, I'm going to give you power to overcome that. That is the power of the gospel. That is what the good news is all about. That not only uh, did Jesus live without sin, but he said, I can give you power so you can do the same thing. That There's virtually no difference between me and you. Now are we the sons of God, and it doesn't appear what we shall be. Who you are today is not who God wants to see you to be in five years, in ten years, in twenty years. Like God wants to make you a new creation. That the vices of life that we all struggle with, uh, the scripture says that uh, we're tempted uh, when we're dry, drawn away of our own lust and enticed. All of us have lust. All of us have desires of things that God said we should not have. We all have desires of things that are harmful to us. How many have a sweet tooth? How many like junk food? How many like their fries with a lot of bit of salt, right? And we know those things are not really good for us, but we have a craving. We have an itch. It's just like you're sitting in bed at 2 o'clock saying, yo, I need that ice cream, man. Uh, that hot fudge is fire man I need that insomnia cookie right now bro that thing is real good to me right we all have that experience and sin is the exact same way it's an addiction it's a thing that when we're laying up at night we say you know what I really don't want to watch that pornography but something's drawing me something's pulling me I don't really want to smoke that weed I I really don't want to go to that party and and get drunk all over again and waste my money but I just have to I I just want that feeling again and we just continue in life going back to the same thing the same thing the same thing but God said there's power in the gospel if you believe God said he's able to deliver you he's able to deliver you that the world might say you need to go to a meeting for addiction but God said if you go down in that water in the name of Jesus Christ I can pull that addiction out of you I can take it out of you And not only do we have to fight our own addiction, uh, but we have to fight uh, the demons in the darkness of this world. uh, The spiritual wickedness in high places where we would want to mind our business. But uh, you see that billboard that attracts your attention. You would want to mind your business, but you're getting that text message from somebody uh, that you shouldn't be involved in. You want to mind your business, uh, but in the back of your head, you're so stressed. uh, You're so fatigued. You just say, I just need a drink, man. I, I just need a party. I just need something. 
to pick me up. But God says, I can give you power over the enemy. I can give you power over Satan in the world that you don't have to be locked up, uh, that you don't have to be shackled uh, to things that people said. That's just a generational curse. Uh, that's just something that happens in your family. God said, I came to give you power. I came to give you life and life more abundantly. That's what Jesus came to give us. And that power is available for all of us. Everyone can access it. And the, the, the Paul let us know it's the power of God unto salvation. How many know they need to be saved? How many know they need a savior? They need somebody to pick them up when they're down. When those things happen in your life and you're just frustrated and you just don't even have sometimes a word to even express. You might have cried so many tears to yourself. I'm tired of this. Uh, but God said, cast your cares on me because I care for you. I care for you. I know I need to be saved. I know I need to be, be redeemed. And uh, salvation really starts with repentance. Salvation starts um, when we recognize there's something wrong with us. When we are humble enough. Because sometimes we just have a pride issue. Sometimes we think too much of ourselves. Uh, the scripture says you're just grass. You're here one moment and you're gone the next. You, you don't got guarantees from five seconds from now. Somebody can drop dead with a heart attack right now. We have no guarantees that something we can't even see can kill us. We see what happened with this virus that, that came through. People all different kind of ages. Young, old, rich, poor. It didn't matter who you were. Dying. And we're still here today. We're still in the house of God with that opportunity. God says, when you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. Don't sit there and second guess what you know is right. Because it doesn't take just preaching to speak to you. God's always speaking to us. God's always giving us chance after chance after chance. And a lot of times we just get a hard heart. Say, Lord, you know, that's just too hard. That's too much. You're asking too much of me. But he said, no, just let me be your savior. Stop looking for someone who's like you to save you. The pastor cannot save you. Your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whatever, fill in the blank, it cannot save you. But there is a Savior that died on a cross and says, I have my spirit that I want to give to you if you receive it. He said, I stand at the door knocking. God's been knocking on our door for years. Come, come to me. Just come. Just give it a try. Just give him a try. You tried every single other thing and you never had success. Just come to me, all that are weary, heavy laden. You have any weights on your life? You have any weights on your heart? Do you have any things that you don't tell nobody about? And it's just weighing you down. And you're trying and you're pulling and you're pushing as much as you can. But God said, I'm waiting for you that you can give that to me. I want to take it. And I don't want to just take it. I want to give you something in exchange. I want to give you a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. God, take my heaviness. Take this load because it's just too much. But that's only if you believe on Jesus Christ. And believing is not just the intellectual thing. And it's not just a moment of understanding the facts, but it's a moment of embracing in your heart what you know that uh, you can't do of your own power, but you have trust. You have faith that, Lord, if I repent like you said in Acts chapter 2, that you repent and you turn away from everything that you possibly can, that you know is not like God, that you might have to get rid of friends, that you might have to distance yourself from family, that you might have to stop listening to certain type of music, uh, that you might not be able to talk to people about those dirty jokes at work, that you might have to make a break from things uh, that you're so connected to, but you realize it's not changing you. You realize you're still carrying the same things that you were carrying from a young child. God said if you repent and turn, I will be waiting. And no, don't just repent, but you need to be baptized in my name. If you really study the scriptures, baptism was happening even in the Old Testament. It was just a representation of something that God wanted to do. 
See, God, he, he kind of telegraphs. He kind of shows us in advance what he wants to do, right? And so baptism is it, it, an outward act, uh, but it's something that happens where we, we jump in the shower, we jump in the bath. Why? To get the dirt off us, to get those things off us. And that's exactly what baptism is about, that you go in that water and somebody calls the name of Jesus over us. And, and when that name is called, uh, uh, the people in Acts said, don't call that name. Don't mention that name because you, you bring his blood upon us. We're thinking about our our guiltiness we're thinking about what we did to that man don't do that but when you call the name of Jesus something else happens his blood is applied and he begins to wash you even Abasha he begins to cleanse you that you can't get any there's no soap you can buy in the store that gets to your soul that gets to the very heart of who you are that gets to that place that you don't talk to people about. That gets to that anger and that unforgiveness. Uh, that gets to that lust, oh God. That gets to those things that you said, I can't get rid of it. No matter how much I tried, I can't get rid of that. But when you get in that water... When you get in that water, you say, Lord, I'm going to try you this time. I, I want to be a new creation in you. He said, old things will be passed away. And behold, all things, no matter what it is, it becomes new. That's what happens. Yes, Pastor, that is the power. But we can't stop there because that is just a moment in time. And our humanity would want to take over. As we, as we know, the scripture in Romans talks about when we know uh, what to do and that is good, uh, we struggle. There's another law in our members. Uh, it doesn't completely get rid of uh, the desires all the time. Uh, but he said, I send uh, the comforter. I send my spirit. Uh, how many just want the spirit of God? If we believe, if we believe that God is who he says he is. If he is this, this, this being that is all-powerful, that uh, there is nothing too hard for him, why wouldn't we want that on the inside? So that the very things we face and the very things we deal with, we have overcoming power. We have power to say no. Even in our minds when we say, I want to say yes, something inside of you. She says, don't do that. Sometimes you, before you, and I can only talk about me, you know, the God, he doesn't force us to do anything. But his spirit comes and speaks to us. And the scripture says it will lead us and guide us into all truth. So I don't even have to get to the situation. God can tell me ahead of time, don't do that. And I won't even be tempted. That the spirit of God will say, don't watch that show. Because sometimes the devil, the scripture says that the devil, he's tricky, he's deceitful, right? And so he tries to get us with little stuff. He tries to get us with things that look innocent. But when you have the spirit of God, you should have a spirit of discernment. And so God will speak to you in a moment. Do not listen to that song. Do not watch that show. And we have an opportunity to obey or not. But that's why the spirit of God is there to empower us, to give us advance warning and say, don't do that. Don't do, if you want to be right, if you want to be saved, don't do that. And if we listen and obey the spirit of God, then it just becomes so much easier. Everything in life, we're not tempted, we're not pulled away because we're constantly obeying. But that's why the Spirit of God comes. That when you have the Spirit of God, when he comes into your life, he said, I'll give you power. I'll give you ability. I'll, I'll, I'll clean you up. I'll change you. I'll transform you. But you need to have the Spirit of God. And you'll know when you have the Spirit of God. It is not something that you have to kind of figure out and somebody has to tell you, oh, you got it. No, no. You will have an experience. That's, that's for you. You'll have an experience so strong that it doesn't matter what somebody else says. You say, no, I know that is real. I know that is real. Sometimes even in your own spirit, you feel depressed. But when you think about the day that you received the spirit of God, something begins to stir in you. Something uh, just begins to move in you. And you get, you get re-energized like I can, I can make it. I, I think about the day that I was saved in November of 15, 2009. And I was just at a place in my own life where I was depressed and suicidal. And I was just tired of all this mess and all this stuff. And I came to church on a Sunday morning and said, God, if you ain't it, I got nothing else. I got no more options. I'm through. I'm finished with this life. And I began to cry out to God. I begin to call on the name of Jesus. The scripture says if you call on his name, you will be saved. You will be delivered. 
And so I called on that name, and, and, and I got to a place and said, God, I just need you. Uh, I wasn't worried about no tongues. I wasn't worried about none of that stuff. I just said, save, Lord. Save, Lord. Save me, God. Save me from myself. Because sometimes I'm my own worst enemy. I don't need no devil to tempt me. There's something in me that's in my flesh that it ain't good. I can't help myself sometimes. But, God, I'm tired of living like that. I'm t- I want power. I want anointing. I want an unction from you so I could just say, no, devil, no. I ain't going back to that life. I ain't going back to that girl. I ain't going back to that gang. I ain't going back to those drugs. I ain't going back to that drink. No, I got power because you said I have power, Lord. That is the power of the gospel. And some of us, that's all we need. We need the power of the Lord. Sometimes we need power to stop cursing and swearing. We need, a, we need power to stop having perverted thoughts. Because it comes to all of us. But when you got the Holy Ghost, son says no. And then a word comes. And you can fight and you can come back. And as, as y'all were saying this morning, when you resist that devil, it might be a fight. It might be a couple punches back and forth. But after a while, by and by, I know I got the, vi- I know I got the victory. I know, I, devil, you got to get out of here. You got to get out. This, this, we ain't playing this no more. I have the authority, not because I have it in myself, but God said, I'll give you the power to tread on scorpions and dragons on every power of the enemy, and nothing will harm you. That's what the Lord wants to do in our life. He wants to give us power. And that's all the power that is in the gospel. It says to everybody that believes. It's simple. You just got to believe it. Sometimes we just don't believe. We allow our own intellect to talk us out of the power of God that could be in our lives. Because we're calculating every single, Lord, but what about this? But what about that? But what? Just obey. Just follow. Just go in that water. Just go in the water. If you want delivery, if you believe that there's power in it, just do it. Just call my name. Just reach out to me. It don't matter. You can reach out to him right now. I don't care. If somebody get the Holy Ghost, I'm okay with it. I'm okay. I don't got to talk. But if you want to, if you want to change in your life, God said, I'm here and I'm waiting because there's more than two or three that are gathered in his name. He said, I'm here right now. That you could just touch the hem of my garment and you can be healed. That you can be delivered. That you could be saved. That you don't have to wait for somebody to say, come to this altar. That right now, if you want it, you can have the deliverance that you need. But that's if we believe. If we make a choice to believe. Because that's what it is. It's a choice. We can believe or we can choose not to believe. But I thank God even in the time where I'm uncertain, even in the time where I'm not so sure, I can say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. I come to you, God, uh, as humbly as I know how. Uh, that I know that you're able. I believe your word and what your word says. But in my own mind, I'm not sure if that's possible. So I need you to help me even now. Uh, and the scripture says that the spirit will make intercession with groanings that we don't know, that we can't utter. Because we don't know what's to pray for we'll ask for a house we'll ask for a car but God said you need a spiritual blessing you need spiritual deliverance and as I give into the spirit of God something begins to shift something begins to change I don't feel the heaviness in my spirit no more I got joy I got peace that the world didn't give and the world can't take away it's all in the gospel it's all in the gospel God's calling somebody today. I know it. Yeah. I feel it. God's calling you today. He's calling you today. Don't delay. Don't wait. Don't wait because you don't know what's going to happen when you walk out those doors. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't got no any guarantees that you're going to come back. You don't have any guarantees that you're going to be able to say your prayers tonight and say, Lord, help me, forgive me. So in the day you hear his voice, in the day that he talks to your situation, in the day that he speaks to your heart and says, that's the truth, don't harden your heart. And this is what the world and the devil wants us to be ashamed of. They want us to be ashamed because the devil understands and realizes that there is power in the gospel. And the only way that the gospel can be given is somebody has to open their mouth. Somebody has to say something. Can you imagine having a friend that had cancer, a friend that was drowning, 
and you knew they could be saved, and you knew somebody that was a great doctor and could swim, and you just let them stay there, we wouldn't do that. So why do we allow people we know to die in sin every day? Why do we allow that to happen? Because we're ashamed. Better yet, we're intimidated. Because the environments that we're in are so anti-God that it causes you to shrink back. Hold on, Matt. But God's saying, this is not the time for that. He's saying, no more. Don't be ashamed. The scripture says, I believe, therefore I have, have I spoken. And so for us that are saved, this part of the message is for you. That no longer can you go into spaces and not say anything. God is calling us to higher. God is calling us to more. Because there is power in our mouth. And how do I know that? Because the very God stood on the edge of nothing and said, let there be, and there was. So he said, that power that I have, I have imparted into you. That power that I have, I have given unto you, that you would go and preach the gospel to everybody. That you would not be ashamed, that you would not let the devil speak in your ear and tell you, oh, don't pray for that coworker. Don't, don't mention the Bible. Don't invite them out to church. Uh, they'll think you're weird. They'll think you're strange. God said, no, there's a time that you need to speak, that you need to stand up and be counted for me. As we talked about on Wednesday, he said, if you're ashamed of me in this untoward generation, I'll be ashamed of you in front of my father. I don't want to be, I don't want God to be ashamed of me so there's time I gotta stand up I have to speak up I have to let somebody know you can be delivered uh, uh, that you can be changed and not just because I know it intellectually but I know what God did in my life anybody have a testimony anybody know where God brought them from that they're not the same person they were a month ago uh, that they're not the same person they were six months ago a year ago but God is a deliverer he can he could deliver you from suicide he could deliver you from depression and anger he can deliver you from times and things that happen when you're a little child that nobody knows about. God can change your life so you're not angry no more, so you're not depressed no more, so you're not dealing with those feelings and thinking there's something wrong with me because somebody abused you. That's the power that God gives us. And it's not a power just for the sanctuary, but it's a power we will experience when we go and we go out. If you look at Acts, almost every single miracle that happened, it wasn't in no church. It wasn't in no synagogue. They was walking around in regular life. And they saw somebody that had a need and said, I have a solution. What did Peter and John say? They were coming from the hour of prayer. You see this man lame. He can't go anywhere. How many people do you know that are stuck? They've been in the same, they've been in the same place since high school. I can go to your house right now. I could go to your apartment right now. You're working the same job. And I'm not saying there's nothing necessarily wrong with it. What I'm really getting at is there's no progress. You're doing the same, literally the same thing you've always done. No maturation, no maturity. Same immature playing around all the time. Stuck. But they want to change. They want a change. What did that man say? He was, he was on the floor. He just had his little can out. Silver and gold, Peter said, have I none. But such as I have, here, I'll give it to you. I don't got no money. I'm broke. I'm poor. <laughs> the Lord knows I don't got no money. But I know somebody that has everything. I know a God that can change your life. That you don't have to be stuck anymore. That you don't have to be shackled anymore. And saints, you know what? I realize, I'm realizing more and more. Sometimes we, we, we're, we're looking for something deep. But God says, it's just a word. That's it. You just speak a word. You don't have to pray for, with somebody for two hours. You don't have to pour oil and dump oil on them for something to change. What did the, the centurion say to Jesus? Just speak the word. In that very hour, something changed. In that very hour, something happened. And God says, you have that authority. You have that power that you can speak a word and something's going to change. But again, it's if we believe it. If we believe it. That's a simple message on this morning. There's power in that gospel. And let's not be ashamed anymore of it. Let's realize that the devil is trying everything he can to shut us down. Everything he can. The scripture says that uh, men would wax worse and worse in the last days. Deceiving and being deceived. 
There's so much false doctrine out here. There's so many false. I'm saying I'm tired of hearing about uh, church church scandals. Every pastor is stealing money. Every pastor is touching some kids. I'm tired of it. But we don't have to be like that. We don't have to have that test. We can, and that's just the devil. That's all it is. The devil is trying to devalue, decredit the power that's in God. So when Pete, when you say, oh, you want to come to church? Oh, they're like, no, nah, I don't really go to church because that's, that's fake. Everybody's a hypocrite. We've heard that one. Everybody's a hypocrite. Fat people go to the gym, so I guess they're hypocrites. I guess they're hypocrites. No, you go because you need a change. So if you need a change, just come to the house of the Lord. You can ask people, you want to do a Bible study. You want to pray. Trust the testimony that you have. That you don't have to know every, every uh, book in the Bible, all 66. But your life is a testimony. Your life. Literally every single person here, whether you've been saved or not, the fact that you're still alive right now, I can guarantee you there's something that's happened in your life when you knew that was God. I know that was God. There's no other way to explain it. That has power. That has power. We could stand at this time. Somebody needs deliverance today. Somebody needs to change today. Hallelujah. And if you're tired of the life you're living, if you're tired of the can't help it and uh, going through the same cycles over and over again, God's saying, I have a plan for you. Hallelujah. That if you repent and be baptized in my name and you receive my spirit, I will make you new. That people won't even recognize who you are anymore. That you could say that used to be me. Huh. But we are washed. We are justified. Mm. By the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Such were some of us. We're sanctified in the name of Jesus in baptism and by His Spirit. So if somebody today wants to be baptized, we're opening up this time for you. Just raise your hand. Don't worry about what anybody else is looking at you or saying or nothing. If you want to change today, like I need this today, I can't wait any longer, I can't wrestle in my spirit anymore, just raise your hand, somebody will get to you. Hallelujah.